this, this is a connection um, to our past, a connection uh, to Africans and, and to black people that we have not seen before. The 7,000 artifacts found on the Henrietta Marie confirmed the appalling abuse the abolitionists supposed. Some are displayed in a museum in Key West, and its executive director, Madeleine Burnside, showed them to me. This is a cauldron that was used to cook the Africans' food, probably from ingredients that might have been fresh when they started, but you know, they're on a six to 14 week voyage. I see two goods. Yes, uh, those are of course new, they haven't been underwater, but that would represent the size of the water ration. It was essentially two coconuts full. I mean, they, they so just this is two coconut shells full for per day per person. So everybody at this point was probably seasick, probably had dysentery. People are throwing up, you, you need four times that. I mean, more people died from dehydration than anything else. Mm -hmm. In the conservation lab, Madeline showed me other artifacts. About a hundred sets of shackles were found. It wouldn't just be one person sort of... Mm -hmm put together, it's to link two people. I mean, if you look at um, some of these drawings, this is, this is probably the most famous. Mm. Um, this is the Brooks. This is a diagram of how they expected the African captives to be laid out. What's really interesting is these, these, these shackles that I've mm -hmm. shown you. This is that exact type. They're this very awkward shape. It's designed to be difficult to walk in. And you can see them, actually, how they were shackled. Every pair of, of people is joined. And that's, that's part of what you see. almost sounds like torture insofar oh, as I would presume that they are not leaping aboard decks every uh, oh, half hour. it's total uh, torture. Yeah, it's total yeah. torture because you, you might find yourself shackled to a dead person for quite a while before somebody figured that out. Other ships could smell a slave trader long before they could see it. The wind would just carry this horrible stench. I'd love to say that we're different now, but we're, we're, we're not. I mean, we just... What do you mean? Well, the slave trade is, is still going on. We're still buying goods in this country all over the place that are made by either slaves or folks who are very close to slaves. There's always some little thread where somebody's buying and selling people and somehow we have never solved that. Buying and selling people, but with the transatlantic slave trade, they were considered less than people, they were considered yes. a commodity. No, this is, this is the worst case. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is the worst case, but it's not better, you know, when children now get taken to be enslaved or, you know, sex, I sex hear, slavery. I hear what you say, and it is I'm not saying an obscenity. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless... The rest of the world sees that as a crime yes. and pays lip service, Absolutely. if nothing else. Absolutely. There was nothing during the three, four hundred years. Yes. The entire world saw and took the part in it. transatlantic yes. slave trade yes. as legal. Absolutely. And, and, I mean, and it, all conspired yes. to an international tragedy that still not only echoes, but screams daily. I mean, that's the difference. These people never again lived in freedom. And they, that, that's what's just... And their descendants are having a pretty tough time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This systematic barbarity outraged campaigners in Britain. But they were opposed by powerful vested interests. 18th century Britain was built on trade and Wilberforce himself came from a family of merchants. They traded with Russia and the Baltic states. Wherever in the world they did business, they all came together at Trinity House in London. I met Ken Cousins there, who has studied the merchants. Let's have a seat and a closer look. Now, the reason I brought you to Trinity House is to look at this portrait 
because it represents the power and influence of the 18th century merchants. Um, we have the Baltic merchants, the uh, East India merchants, and of course the um, West India merchants represented. Mm -hmm. They look like men of distinction, but I mean, how influential were these men? Very influential indeed. Influential enough to, to encourage this gentleman, William Pitt, mm -hmm. to come here and attend their meetings. These merchants had the ear of the government. And would you say that they were essential to the economy of the country? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is what these gentlemen were doing. In the teeth of fierce opposition, and only three years after Wilberforce's first speech, Parliament resolved to gradually abolish the trade, but the merchants did their utmost to hold back the bill. Gradual started to look like never. With such powerful opposition, I wondered how the bill ever became law. Professor Walvin, Laura, nice to see, how you. Nice to see you. Let's go inside. Wow. Historian Jim Walvin offered to show me where centuries of British law is stored. Laura, I think we've got the right alley. In the Victoria Tower, in the House of Lords, is the original Act Room. Kept at a constant 16 degrees centigrade, it stores Acts of Parliament going back over 500 years. We're about to find it under the actual chronological year. I suspect we're here. This is the one, George III, and it's number 60. There we go, number 60. Okay. Let me carefully take that wow. out. There it is. It should tell us somewhere. Um, there it is. That's the one. That's the one. An act for the abolition of the slave trade. 20th of March, 1807. Good gracious. History in your hands. Extraordinary. 20 years' work in one roll of vellum. Let's have a look at it. Hmm. Must be very careful opening this. Yes. What does it what say? Beautiful script. It is, isn't it? And there we are. Le roi le veut. The king wishes it. It's been given the royal assent. I don't want to touch it. No, <laughs> all right, I'll take care of that. Twenty nice years enough. after he'd started, Wilberforce finally achieved his goal. But the reason it finally passed had little to do with him. In the end, the merchants were wrong-footed by a separate act, which banned ships carrying captives for other countries, such as France and Spain. This wiped out most of the merchants' profits and made Wilberforce's abolition bill academic. Twelve months before 1807, there was an act which scuppered the whole scheme, irrespective of what came in 1807. It was an act that was slipped in not by Wilberforce, but by others, and that act took away the very great bulk of the British slave trade at a stroke and people at the time didn't recognize that it would have that effect. The abolition bill made the shipping of African people illegal. For Wilberforce, Britain was free of a great sin. But in Britain's colonies, slavery remained legal and yet the bill was proclaimed an act of national altruism. I just don't get the difference between the sin of the trade and the sin of uh, slavery. I don't quite see why he would make that distinction. I think one of the problems with uh, the attitude towards the slaves and plantations is that they are property. And here's a really interesting question that the abolitionists wrestle with. How do you square, reconcile the issue of property versus humanity? Wilberforce genuinely believed that if you cut the supply of Africans to the plantations, the planters would have to treat slaves better in order for the population to rise naturally. But this actually would, act, long term, perhaps a generation down the line, would see the population increase without buying new Africans. Um, so get rid of the slave trade, and somehow or other this actually improves the lot of Africans toiling in the Caribbean. Wilberforce's conviction that the 1807 bill would be enough was misplaced.
If Wilberforce had traveled to the Caribbean himself, he might have seen why. 